Happy Sabbath, everyone. Orlando Filipino Seventh-day Adventist Church here in sunny Florida, USA, is welcoming you today. Thank you for spending time with us at Ofsda SS Online here in our media center. My name is Teresa Lanoza, your online coordinator and host. If you're watching us on YouTube and or Facebook or our church website, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Also feel free to share with everyone you know. We never know who might be searching for God's truth. If you'd like to interact with us live, send us your comments and or questions in the social media of your choice, as already mentioned. As you know, most of the Sabbath School programs, podcasts, or online studies out there are pre-recorded. But here at Ofsda, we are live. I'm going to be posting questions and or comments that are going to be discussed by our panelists. I'd like to remind you, if you don't have a copy of our brand new fourth quarter lesson for this year, entitled On Death, Dying, and the Future Hope, we have three options for you. Number one, go online to either ABSG, which stands for Adult Bible Study Guide, dot adventist.org or ss which stands for sabbath school net.org number two find a local seventh day adventist church near you and study along with them and number three of course continue to join us here at ofsda ss online however please be reminded that we're not a replacement of going to church for worship so if you're here locally in Orlando, Florida, and also a member of OFSDA or regular guest, come to our sanctuary where we have separate Sabbath school classes in English, Tagalog, Visaya, Ilocano, and even have a class for the youths and also Spanish if needed. Today, we're on lesson number three entitled, Understanding Human Nature. At this time, let me introduce our panelists for today. To my farthest right is Marlon Lanoza, Next to him is Isa Liston, and next to me is Terry Konsenko. So Marlon, we'll start with a word of prayer. Okay, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, this is an important topic on the theme of life, death, resurrection, and eternal life, understanding human nature. I pray in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would guide us into truth. Bless each Sabbath school member around the world, including our team gathered here in the Media Center and those studying with us today in all churches. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, and as you've heard before, our topic or our lesson today is understanding human nature, or I also want to say understanding living souls. Mm -hmm. uh, now this topic or this lesson has lots of controversy and disagreement over this topic specifically, but uh, as you, some YouTubers say, let's just jump right into it. Okay. <laughs> so one way to understand this question um, or this topic is in the beginning of our human life, which is in the book of Genesis. So Terry, could you please read for us Genesis 1, verse 26 to 27. Okay. Genesis 1, verse 26 through 27 says... Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay, awesome. So going, reading this verse, right? So you can see that God formed other living creatures, not just humans, but also the birds and the fish and the animals. And so what was a unique uh, feature or what's unique about the creation of the human family compared to the rest of animals with humans and animals? Well, based from the verse that I just read, God made us in his own image. He mm -hmm. didn't make the birds out of his own image, but he made us as um, his own image. Amen. Yeah, amen. It, it, it says right there as well, right? In verse 27. Uh, you said, do you, what do you think is the difference between these animals and the humans? It's um, especially with us. I think it's that we also have dominion over the creatures mm -hmm. of the earth. And amen. that's what makes us special. Yeah, like dominion, like 
we rule over them or, you know, we have like, I guess, a better intelligence over yes. them, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you don't see uh, some monkeys or birds <laughs> controlling like a car, right? Or a dog <laughs> driving a car, right? But um, yeah, that's a, that's a very solid uniqueness. I think also there's another uniqueness that isn't shown in this verse, but it is shown in, ver in Genesis 2, verse 7. Isa, could you please read us that one? And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Mm. So humans were formed of the ground, right? rather than God creating animals, just like God's words. Um, I think, what, what, what do you think uh, is, is unique there, right? Um, he breathed into us, and mm. that's how we became alive. Mm. Or Adam became alive. Yeah. Especially uh, in, that, in the first part of the verse, right, it says, God formed man. So do you think God formed man, like, like he made him, right, with, with his own hands? I know, Terry, you do a lot of pottery, right? <laughs> or you like sculpting, right? How, yeah. how hard is that for, like, sculpting things or something like that? It takes a lot of time because you need to get, you know, the details, getting the right shape, getting the right form, make sure it's not floppy but sturdy. And I feel like just as you uh, mentioned that, when God created us, you know, from the dust of the ground, he took his time, right? Compared to, you know, like you mentioned about the animals, right? He just said it from his words and it happened. God is very powerful. He could have just said that to us. Mm -hmm. And it's so like, create humans. And then, you know, we could have formed. But no, God wanted us to be special and to be created in his own image. So he took, a, took that time to be able to form us beautifully and wonderfully made. Amen. Yeah, amen. amen. That's very true, especially... Comparing to animals, he just said, animals. Mm -hmm. And then, it, you know, it, yeah. popped, it popped in there, but he took time with us. Thank you so much for sharing with that. So, since God formed us uh, through the dust with his own hands, right, as what Terry mentioned, let's see in that same verse, Genesis 2, 7, how God created the living human soul. So, I will read the same verse what Isa wrote, uh, that Isa read, but instead of the New King James Version, I believe that's what you read, right? I'll be reading from the New King James Version. So, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and became a living soul. So, that's coming from the King James Version. So, with this verse, how, how did the Lord create a living human soul this time? Looking at it as a, as, as a different verse in a different perspective. Well, it's kind of the same thing from the New King James Version. You know, God did form us, you know, from dust, from the ground, and then breath, um, life into us. And that's how we become living being or living soul. And I think that means they're the same thing. Living being and living soul are the same. Right. So that soul, uh, actually the breath, as you said, because as we mentioned before, he formed us, right, mm -hmm. uh, with his hands from the dust. And then when he breathed into his nostrils, he became a living soul, right? So God breathed into his nostrils and he gave life, living life, living soul. So with these verses, right, and these comparisons of these different versions, um, the way that we are created is the combination of the dust of the ground and the breath of life of God. And that makes a living soul. So for simple terms, right? If you like math, if you like math, it's dust plus the breath of life, God's breath, is equal to the living soul, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so that means, so like, that means the soul cannot be extracted from our bodies, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, like you, su you sometimes see in movies, right? Where you see the soul sucking and, uh, and you become limp and dead, right? It's not like that. It's not like that in the movies. But it's very, very, very <laughs> crucial that we have to understand that uh, these two entities are not separated. Uh, the soul is not separated. We are living souls. Now which that's, which uh, um, right now, Hollywood mm -hmm. and uh, Pixar and, you know, like uh, Disney movies capitalize on these, the immortality of the soul, right? Mm -hmm. So... 
that's good that you guys are talking about. Yeah, like, especially like even learning throughout this lesson, I was, I was so confused. I'm like, but isn't like there's like a little soul that that, that could like get out of my body and I could like just <laughs> just chill around and everything like how it is in the movies, but. Uh, really understanding this and these couple verses and throughout this lesson, that's not the case. And, you know, it's very it messed up with my uh, yeah. worldview. Yeah, yeah, you could just imagine for those who don't read the Bible mm -hmm. that they could easily get uh, deceived. Yeah, and persuaded, yeah. yeah. You know, so it's important that you know that when you read the Bible, which is the standard of our belief, that that's not biblical, Right. Mm -hmm. so go ahead. And it's also proven in Acts 27, verse 37, right? And Terry, if you could mm -hmm. read that verse for us. Okay, Acts 27, verse 37, it says, And we were in all in the ship, 203 score and 16 souls. Mm -hmm. So for context for this, uh, this verse, so Paul, the author of this book, uh, was in a very terrible shipwreck. You could read that in throughout that, the book of Acts. And he was saying how many people there were in this ship, right? And how many people were on the ship, you guys? What does it say in there in the verse? 276. Yeah. 203 score and 16, which, yes. which stands for 276 souls, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or persons. And I know not only people say souls for ships, because that's a very weird thing to say. Oh, there's... There's 10 souls in, on a boat. There's five souls. But it also says that in airplanes, right? I know, uh, I know there's some uh, pilots that are out there in our church, right, uh, that use the term souls rather than people. So that is proof that souls cannot detach from the body. So leading up, this, up to this question, why is it important to understand that human beings are living souls rather than possess souls that exist apart from the body? Um, I think it's uh, what makes us special because we have souls, right? And unlike animals, like, they don't really have it, but God gave us souls. Mm. It's, yeah. No, I, I, I understand that. Like, compared to back to the animals, we were formed. And not only that, we were breathed in our nostrils. I don't think he did that with the rest of the animals, and that just makes us... Uh, special because we do have living souls compared to the rest of the animals. Terry, what do you think? Uh, why is it so important for this understanding? Well, it's important to understand because, like um, Auntie Teresa said, like you know, we can be deceived a lot in the world with you know all these movies, all these shows that like souls can be a different thing. It's like a little ghost compared to mm -hmm. separate from our own body. But we did mention that you know, living beings and living souls are the same because God did form us from the ground, plus, you know, his breath of life, make us alive and becoming living souls. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's what the, the world thinks and uh, what we see in movies and shows. And it's, it's very, very important of that we refer to the scripture because that's our foundation in our everyday understandings. You know, even, even uh, I know me and Terry were in a psychology class, right? <laughs> Oh my goodness, all the humanism and, uh, mm -hmm. but we have a foundation in, in the Bible, in Christ. Amen. And um, also, another thing is that it's also a lie that Satan has said to Adam and Eve when they said, you will not surely die. Mm -hmm. Saying that, oh, you won't surely die. Your soul will be floating up in the, in the, in, on earth, seeing everything. You'll be chilling, right? <laughs> but now that begs the question, if we die, when, uh, then where does the soul go if it's not floating everywhere? So let's mm. see in uh, Ezekiel 18, verse 4, and also verse 20. Uh, Esau, so just to recap a little bit. Sure. So back to your question of why is it important to understand that human beings are living souls rather than possess souls that can exist apart from the body. In other words, we are living souls. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you back, you were saying to math addition, so we're formed from the dust of the ground and God breathed into us or into Adam the breath of life. So we are called living souls. It's not souls are in us. Mm -hmm. You know, we are called living souls. So if we die, 
that breath that God gave to Adam and passed on to us goes back to him. Yes, and we'll mention that in Ezekiel 18 and 4. Thank you so much. So, Isa, let's, let's see that context, what uh, Sister Teresa mentioned here in Ezekiel 18, verse 4. Verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. And verse 20. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Mm -hmm. So this is a very um, uh, crunchy verse, I guess, as what did you say. Um, what important truth can we learn about the human soul from the word of the Lord recorded by prophet Ezekiel in these couple of verses? Well, just based on Ezekiel 18 verse 4, it just shows that God possesses all of us, mm -hmm. all of us as um, souls. It all souls belong to God. And just as we mentioned that souls and living beings are the same. So meaning that when we die, right, that we just go back to how it was before when he created us, mm. which is, you know, hit the, hit our breath, right, goes back to God, and then we come back to the dust that from where God created us from. Mm -hmm. uh, also, sorry, here you go. Uh, also in verse 4, it says, the soul who sins shall die. So it's saying the souls not connected with God are basically dead, mm -hmm. in addition to what Terry was saying. No, for real, like, uh, especially... That verse, I like how you brought up that particular ending of that verse. So that means like when we die, right, the soul will die as well, you know. So it's another connection of uh, that we are living souls, that our soul is not a separate entity of us. It's of us. And when the soul dies, we die as well. Um, I also want to bring up to you guys uh, about verse 20. Do you guys have anyth anything about verse 20? It's very interesting that it says, like, the son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. Mm -hmm. Meaning that, like, we all hold responsible to our actions and the sins that we do carry upon ourselves. And if we do follow uh, the righteous, it will fall into us, no one else, mm. right? And same thing with the wickedness. If you follow the wickedness, it falls onto us and not for everyone else. No one, you can't blame anyone for being either righteous or wickedness. You don't share that responsibility. It's from your own. So Yeah, we're accountable of our own uh, wickedness or our righteousness, right? You also have, like, a choice in whether to, like, choose God or wickedness. And basically it's saying you reap what you sow. So if you reap righteousness you like so righteousness and that's mm. of God and wickedness is of evil. So, yeah. yeah. And I think, uh, I think I took a little bit of different spin on this. It, when I, when I see, uh, the son shall not bear the guilt of the father nor the father bear the guilt of, guilt of the son. I, I see like, um, I see like the dead soul of the father, the dead soul of the son cannot make you good or evil. You know what I mean? It's like their soul will die as well. And me looking at this just made me re remember, it seems like the Bible uh, or everything that Disney has, pro has promoted or all the movies that I've watched from Disney or whatever really contradicts the Bible, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, you know, in Mulan or something, how like the old ancestors like oh Mulan you're going to be a bad person you know what I mean and it's like that's not the case here you know because our the souls of our ancestors or our loved ones will not uh, come back to life yeah, like come back that. to life and say like hey you be right or you be good you know it's well as what we mentioned we're accountable of our righteousness as our of our wickedness and we reap what we sow, right? So, as we mentioned, since there's no separate existence uh, outside of the body, that when we die, and uh, we return to dust. That's what happens when we die. Uh, but good thing that's not 
it. That's not the final end. There is hope. Now let's see in John 6, 40. I'll be reading that from the New King James Version. And it says, And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Amen. So, looking at this verse, right, is it possible to possess eternal life and still be mortal, uh, subject to death? Yes. <laughs> Just based from the verse, it says, Who sees the Son and believes in Him shall have everlasting life. And if you die, even at the end part here, it says, I will raise Him up at the last day. So we do see that there is hope even if we do die, right? And we believe in um, Christ and Jesus, right? He will bring us up again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That everlasting life is promised to you in time, not right now. So what you see in your Hollywood movies is now you have it now. Mm -hmm. And I know you're going to be discussing that a little bit more, how that is flawed. So go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I because sometimes we get confused. I mean, when I was studying this, I got really confused. Uh, but we don't have eternal life now because we're still living in a mortal life, right? We still live on this earth. Yep. Um, but the thing is, when Jesus comes, which we'll be uh, seeing later on throughout this chapter, we will have that eternal life. Uh, it's just sometimes movies and shows uh, skew our way of thinking that we have eternal life right after we die, or right now. Yep. Um, Satan wants us to think that. And I'm not saying that all Hollywood movies are bad, but they don't know any better. Mm -hmm. They don't read the Bible. And the Bible is our standard of uh, belief. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so the resurrection is crucially, uh, crucially important. Because um, I want to mention up this question. The reason why the resurrection is important is because we need the resurrection. If, if we have eternal life uh, now, right? If we have eternal life now, why even have Jesus coming back for us? Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's like telling people who, uh, who, if they believe that the dead, righteous dead, go directly to heaven, it's like Jesus telling these people, okay, we're going to go back to earth. And just pretend you're excited, okay? <laughs> just pretend when I come that you'll say, oh, Jesus is here. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, Jesus comes to earth for the living righteous. Yeah, that's good. But how about the, the, the righteous dead who they think are enjoying heaven? You know? And then you l later on read that the dead do not know anything. They don't even praise God and all that. So... Can you think of heaven not praising, not doing anything? So what are they doing up in heaven? Mm. Probably, we'll discuss yeah. that later on. Okay. So, as you can see, like, uh, the resurrection, we need Jesus. We need Jesus to resurrect us from mm -hmm. the death, especially for us humans, especially mm -hmm. for us human beings. And uh, <laughs> we'll see this in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15. Terry, could you please read that for us? For, uh, 1 Thessalonians 14, oh, sorry. First Thessalonians 4, verse 15 through 18. Okay. And it says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven without a shout, or with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet, trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Mm. Amen. So we will be with the Lord, right? So why is the resurrection from the dead when Jesus returns in glory so important for mortals like us who have been redeemed by faith in Jesus as our Savior. What do you guys think about this? 
it's pertaining to the, this verse that we just read as well. The resurrection of the dead is important when Jesus returns in glory is so that like those who live for God, they're going to be brought up again. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be left dead forever because, mm. yeah, they had their time. And yeah, that was the yeah. promise. Yeah, very good. Yeah, and we'll be alive Thanks, Isa. Yeah. and we'll be resurrected, right? Terry, what do you think with this one? Why is it so comforting or why is it so important that we have this hope? Well, it's important to have this hope because, you know, we mentioned this is God's promise to us, right? For those that remain faithful to, you know, Christ and we are redeemed by faith in, in Jesus, that we will be saved and we will be caught up and be able to be with, you know, the righteous people that are dead and those that are alive with the Lord. And meaning that death is not the end you know we mentioned that as before so it gives us that hope that like there is another you know thing that we should be looking forward to and that we shouldn't be sad for you know death when it happens mm. or even be worried when mm -hmm. death happens or fearful when death happens right um and i think just having that hope that we don't have to worry that we don't have to fear is just very comforting you know mm -hmm. that we don't have to you know uh be stressed out like oh I have to do this in a certain way because if I die, my family will, no. Um, and you can see here in this verse as well, as Terry read, that um, the specific order that Jesus, uh, Jesus put down, uh, right? Like the, vo the angel will shout and the voice of the archangel will come, the trumpet will sound next. And you can see that Jesus is not just a bunch of randomness, random fluff, right? or he's not going off of a, a improv, you know? But he has an order, and a specific order that he has. Because uh, the resurrection is very important. That's something that you can't just make on the top of your mind. It's, uh, it's important for us as humans. Yeah. Um, you notice what uh, Terry read uh, in verse 18, mm -hmm. you know, after all that, it says, therefore comfort one another with these words, mm. you know, um, it just tells us when Jesus promises, you can take it to the bank. Mm -hmm. It's for real because otherwise it will make him a, as a liar, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever you read in the Bible are promises to us and you could hold on to them. And sometimes we forget. That's why verse 18 is there. Therefore, comfort one another with these words, especially when we have a loved one that had passed away. You know, it's very hard. We get wrapped up in ourselves and like, poor me, I don't have a grandma anymore, you know, or I don't have a mother anymore or dad. So, yeah. And it really also says that, that we really do need Jesus. Because mm -hmm. um, without Jesus, we, how can we be comfort? How can we have comfort in these words if we don't have Jesus? And so with these words, with these comforting words, that we don't need to worry about our friends or family looking down from us from heaven uh, or that our friends or family being tortured forever, right? Uh, forever in, you know, in hell. We don't need to worry about that because as we saw here and in the previous verses, when we die, it is like we're sleeping. We don't have a soul that's floating around as we mentioned before, but we have, but that we are living souls. Mm -hmm. We and are the soul, yep. And we, ha we are souls, we are living souls who are in need of a savior. Mm -hmm. um, and so let's see in Genesis 2, uh, 7 again, this talks about souls. And let's see what happens when the soul dies. He said, let's, uh, let's read Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Okay, so... We went through this uh, verse of before. What happened when the breath of God entered the lifeless form of Adam? What happened to him? He became alive. Yes. He became right. a living soul or a living being. Mm -hmm. He became a living soul. Uh, and so remember, we remember how the living soul is created. Let's see how the Bible where is the reversal creation and when the living soul dies. Uh, I'll be reading that in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 6 through 7. Remember, let's, let's see the reversal of this creation. Now it says, Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosened, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher shattered at the fountain, 
or the wheel broken at the well. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Uh, let's also go a little bit deeper as well with Psalms 104, verse 29. Terry, you have that verse? Yes. So Psalms 104, verse 29 says, You hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. Mm. So going through all the verses that we, we saw here, right? How is death an undoing of creation? Well, as I mentioned before, right? God formed us from the beginning with, from the ground and then brought us life to become a living soul, right? Or to become alive. And then reverse that mm -hmm. is when we die, our breath goes back to God, right? And then we go down to the ground. You know, when, you know, when, pe when someone dies in a funeral, we all go down to the ground, right? And we go back to the dust where we were formed. Mm -hmm. It's literally like a reversal of how creation of humans was made, right? Like, mm -hmm. as you said. And in the Bible, the soul does not go to God. It's only the breath. I know a lot of people uh, confuse that sometimes because, again, remember the soul sucking or... Uh, mm -hmm. Right? But the breath. So even when we die, we return to dust like, it's, like we're sleeping. And the thing is, we have this hope that Jesus <laughs> will resurrect us from the dead, right? Uh, so... A question for everyone, uh, also for you guys online as well. Uh, while we have hope in a, re in a resurrection from the dead, through faith in Jesus, why is losing someone in death such a painful experience? We have this hope, right? We have this hope that Jesus is coming. Why is it still so hard for us to uh, grieve when someone, uh, like a loved one, it's uh, has gone away? It's because, like, um, since we were created by God, uh, He allowed us to have emotions to express ourselves freely. And one emotion is sadness. So, like, losing someone close to you is obviously very, very saddening. And, mm. like, you can mourn, and it's okay to mourn. And, like, don't stop yourself from mourning. Mm. But we still have this hope in Jesus Amen. that we may see them again. Amen. Yeah, we, it's human nature. Uh, it's, it's only natural to cry when, we have, when we're sad of losing a loved one. We, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be happy or whatever, right? It's something that we cherish, right? Terry, what do, you, what do you think? Why is it so hard for us? It's so hard because we already made like, long-term connections and relationships mm -hmm. with them that you know, when they're you know, gone and not existent anymore from this earth, right? We tend to, you know, be sad because we cannot create newer memories with them. We can only just remember all our past times together. And, you know, it's a bit sad to feel. And even, you know, when Jesus, right, found out when Lazarus died, Jesus even wept. You know, mm. and the, the shortest verse says Jesus he wept, wept right? Yeah. So it means that, like, you know, if Jesus was able to be sad for Lazarus, right, it means that, like, we can also be sad as well, as, like, Issa mentioned, God did give us emotions to express ourselves, and, you know, it's okay to feel sad when um, we do lose a loved one. But, of course, we shouldn't be sad to the point, like, we're hopeless. Mm -hmm. We should always remember that we have this hope that when Jesus does come, you know, we will be risen again. Yeah, amen. I, I want to touch on the memories. I like what you said, um, that we won't experience memories with them, or even future memories with them. Uh, with the loved ones who has passed away. And that reminds me of this quote. Uh, it's from Benjamin Franklin, right? He says, we will not appreciate water until the well runs dry. In the context of what we're talking about, it's like people can't appreciate, you know, our friends or family or a loved one until they're gone. And, of course, I, I really like the, the, how they, um, how they mentioned the hope every single time. You always have this hope that even though that your loved ones are gone, even though that we might experience and we grieve for a long period of time, we still have this hope, uh, right? That Christ will resurrect us. A um, Couple of comments. Sure. Uh, yes. There's one uh, from uh, our website. Jim Walters is back from, uh, uh, well, actually, He's calling us from uh, Malin, Oregon. Mm. He said that he wasn't able to communicate because he was on a ca phone call to Davao, Mindanao. Wow. So he 
It's probably gone there. Um, and then we have someone from YouTube. We have Simple Tech Fix mm. in response to your question. Why is losing someone in death still such a painful experience even when we have hope in a resurrection from the dead through faith in Jesus Christ? Okay, these are his answers. Pretty deep. When sin entered the picture, there's, there are things that happen that we end up getting used to like falling of leaves, like right now we have fall season, the beautiful leaves, right? <laughs> Weather changes, mm -hmm. being tired, etc. Being mm -hmm. tired, then you get to sleep, right? He also says that death is so opposite to the plan of God that it's the one thing that God doesn't want us to get used to. Mm. That's why no matter how many times it happens, it always affects us in different ways. How many times have we gone to funerals, right? And we always cry. Furthermore, he said, there's a scripture that says God places eternity in the heart of each of us. So deep down, we will always want to live forever, eternal life. And that's in Ecclesiastes 3.11. You have that, my... Uh, my my uh, internet froze, but uh, it says here in the World English Bible, it says, he, he, meaning God, has made everything beautiful in its time. He also has set eternity in their hearts, yet so that man can't find out the work that man has done from the beginning even to the end. When God created Adam and Eve, he meant for them to live forever, for us to live forever, you yeah. know? So death was something introduced to them by Lucifer. Yeah. You know? God never intended for us to experience death. Mm -hmm. You know? It's like, it, it, there's a lot of people who are not Christians, right? That always say, why, why did God have my family member to die, you know? It's not God. God never intended us to experience death. He created us not for us to die. Mm -hmm. You know, that's our decision, uh, the decision from Adam and Eve, right? Yeah. Uh, when they chose the fruit, of the, uh, for the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, they were the ones who chose death, uh, death you know? Yep. But the death in itself is sometimes good. You know, I've been a nurse for quite some time, and there's always a soft spot in my heart for hospice care, you know, providing uh, care for the terminally ill. So there are times when due to heredity or um, health care or what you call healthy like decisions, lifestyle decisions, we bring, bring on diseases or whatever, that uh, sometimes the body is not able to heal itself anymore. So it's, it's okay to, to die. And as long as we understand that that death is sleep and we don't mourn like we don't have hope. Mm. You know, as long as they accept Jesus as their personal savior, they have that hope. Yeah. You'll discuss that some more. Yeah, right. especially if, since we live in a world of pain and suffering. I don't think we would want to experience that for forever. For a you know, for life long, and so talking about death, right, is is saddening for us. But uh, even though it's saddening, we still have this hope, as we've been mentioning, and we'll see this this hope in First Thessalonians four thirteen. Isa, could you please read that for us? But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Hmm. So why is it healthy to grieve with hope? Because we do have this hope, right? Why is it healthy to grieve with hope when loved ones die? Well, when you grieve without hope, you actually carry that throughout your whole entire life until maybe the day you die. And it becomes like a burden and then it can, you can feel like depression and sadness all mm -hmm. the time, thinking like there's no hope in this world. But when we do grieve with hope, we are reminded you know, about Christ, and then we start to focus more about Jesus coming, and we get more excited of for His coming, Amen. right? And that's something that we should always be reminded of, and that we should remember 
that we mentioned um, in the previous verses, if I can remember it, where it says comfort one another with mm-hmm. these, right? Mm-hmm. We should be able to comfort one another to remind them of this hope and that so they don't have to carry this sad and this burden that they feel as if, you know, that this is it. This is the end, you know? There's nothing to look forward to. So. Right, so it is possible to grieve with hope, right? Mm-hmm. I know it sounds like an oxymoron, right? How could you be sad but still be hopeful, right? But as he said that it's possible. And because um Isa, what do you what do you think on this? Why why do you is why is it healthy to grieve with hope? Uh, in addition to what Terry said, like um grieving without hope, it it's it's like bottling up mm. inside of you and like it's worse than grieving with hope. Because mm. you have this hope, but again, that human emotion that allows you to express freely, like allows you to mourn, but you have hope. So that's the good part. Mm-hmm. Then without hope. So yeah. Yeah, no, I get that. It's, you, could, you could really see the difference between someone who ha- who's grieving for someone who has hope compared to a person who's grieving without hope, right? And you could see the difference, like maybe people without hope, they'll be like wailing or, ah, or <laughs> screaming in agony. You, you've seen those, uh, those screamers or whatever, that they, the, the paid actors, the screamers. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, it's, you can see the difference. Um, I'm not too sure if you have any experience with those type of people, but I've seen some of those people that, or even just the environment. You could tell either if it's a like an SCA, like a true SCA funeral compared to like, I don't know, something else. You could see it. Uh, you could feel it. You could experience it. And um, I've attended, uh, um, you know, uh, from Catholic friends funeral. And uh, I would always be so amazed, like, you know, towards the time when they put the coffin in, whether it's a mausoleum or uh, in the ground, that the immediate family would wail and start shouting and pounding on the coffin mm. and saying, why did you leave me? Why? Why? It was one uh, joke even. Somebody pushed that person in. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you want to go? Just go and push. I know that's funny, but, you know, like they have to make this drama of like, why? Or it's like, you take know? me with you, take you me take with you. You take me with you and, and that's why. The- <laughs> Here, you go with them right now. Yeah. But um, we know that we have this hope. Yeah, we might be, uh, but we, we know that we have this hope, right? Amen. But it's, it's hard if we don't know someone else's, right? Mm. So how can we grieve with hope even if we're not certain of the final destiny of the loved one who has fallen asleep in death? I know that might be very hardening or very troubled to even think of like a loved one who's died that you don't really know if they were a good person or what do you guys think? Are you thinking of uh, someone who might have committed suicide? Is that sure. your thing? It's one of them, right? One of those? Yeah, go ahead. Unpack that. Well, we just know that like the first death or as we call it, like falling asleep, right? It's only just temporary, right? When Jesus does come, everybody will be able to see him, you know, even those that are dead and those that are alive, they will be able to see him. And, you know, we can't judge or really know what their final destiny is. We don't, we don't know what their life is, if they even, you know, did choose. But I also read an interesting um, topic a long time ago in, like, psychology class. That, like, even though your body has died, your, bo- your brain actually still functions for like seven minutes. Mm. So meaning that that's still enough time for you to still accept Christ, right? Mm. And still have that like little like hope and faith that, you know, you can still be saved. Yeah. So, so that, that means the, per- the body has not really died. You have that seven minute, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, time frame mm-hmm. before the breath of life goes back to God. Mm-hmm. And seven minutes is a long time. That's, yeah, that's seven, powerful. Yeah. That is powerful. And it's um, literally anything could happen in those seven minutes, right? What, what do you think, Isa? Um, 
All I can really say is that, like, you allow yourself to mourn about it, yes, but, like, just focus on the promise of Jesus. Like, you can't really worry too much about where someone's going. I mean, of course, yes, you can, but don't put all your focus into that. Like, mm. there's, there's, like, more things to look forward to. Yeah, amen. Because, like, anything could happen. Like what Terry says, anything could happen those seven minutes. Like, even an example of a situation, the thief on the cross, right? Mm-hmm. As mm-hmm. you've known, he was a thief for, like, and he's done evil things for, like, his whole life. His whole mm-hmm. life, right? But at the moment mm-hmm. where, uh, at the moment where the thief was on the cross with Jesus, mm-hmm. and he sees the reaction of everyone, and he sees Jesus saying, Father, please forgive them, but they don't know what they're doing. He says, the thief is like, something doesn't add up. Something's not right. And even though he was right there in pain, dying, we know that uh, Jesus said that uh, he will be in heaven when he uh, comes back, right? And the, on the second coming. And so, like what Isa said, we, our focus should not be judge our, our judgment towards those people. Even though we might not know uh, the hearts or the final destiny of that person, we do know the heart of Christ. Amen. You know? Amen. That we do have to let go of our judgment. Because if we do think of that, our thinking is skewed. Our thinking is off. We would be like God. Mm-hmm. We're not God. So that's good that you said that, that it's important. We may not know, because I struggled through with this. Mm-hmm. When we were in Illinois, there was a family member whose son committed suicide, mm-hmm. and he was in an SDA university. Mm-hmm. Okay? And I have a coworker whose grandson uh, hung himself at home. You know, so I was struggling with that. And I said, Dear Lord, it doesn't sound fair. You know, this one who was in an SDA university had a bad decision. That one time had a bad decision. Whatever he was going through, you know. So I was praying to God, dear Lord, reveal yourself to me. How could I reconcile that? You know, I'd like to know. And that's where I read it, you know, that all it takes, and seven minutes is a long time, Terry. Mm -hmm. All it takes is, even if that person said, Dear Jesus, save me. Or just calling his name, Jesus. Realizing that you have reached the point of no return. Mm -hmm. You know, when you hang yourself and you're struggling and this rope is tightening on you and no one is there to help you, you know, you realize, oh my gosh, what have I done? Right then and there, you could just say, Jesus, please forgive me. We know the heart of God. We don't know the heart of people who've died. But because we have, we're uh, serving, worshiping a compassionate, loving God, he's not going to turn his head away and say, ah, it's too late for you. <laughs> he or she is reaching out and said, Jesus, help me. Mm-hmm. I've made a big mistake. So I love that. Thank you, Marlon, mm-hmm. that, you, that you said that we know the heart of God, mm-hmm. not necessarily the person who died. And that's how strong... God's hope is. It's not just for those. It's for us. It's for you. It's for me. Anyone who's watching. That's how God's, that's how strong God's hope and God's love is for you and for me. Amen. And so we'll see more of this uh, um, in the next verses. So I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians uh, verse 15, verse 26. Um, it says, the last enemy will be destroyed is death. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Amen. Plain and simple. So death will be destroyed. Now, let's go in more depth with this topic in Revelation 20, verse 14 through 15. Terry, if you please read that for us. Okay, and this says, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Mm. Okay, so anyone who might be out there, right, that might be hearing this for the first time and maybe wondering, what is the second death? What is the book of life? Is, is there a first death? Um, so mm-hmm. 
just a short little summary. Um, you could read the word and research this for yourself, but here's just a little tiny summary. So the first death is what we're talking about earlier in this lesson, right? When we sleep, when we go back to the dust of the earth, is the sleeping process uh, where the body returns to the dust and the breath goes back to God, right? Um, so, which could be for everyone, anyone, mm -hmm. anyone who's righteous, righteous or anyone evil, who's yeah. wicked, anyone. Uh, it could be for you, for me, I don't know. So, people who believe and people who don't believe in Christ. But the second death, um, according to Webster Dictionary, it says an eternal separation from God. So this is the eternal, right? Because not only will be, this is the second death. So not only will be resurrected, but it's an eternal forever separation from God. And it seems like we do not want to be in that second death, right? Mm -hmm. So because as this verse says, whoever is found in the book of life will not experience second death. So how, the question is, how are you going to be written in the book of life? Mm. You know? How, how can we be in the, written in the book of life? If you declare Jesus as your Lord, personal Lord and Savior, if you go through baptism, you're able to, you know, your, your name is written in the book of life. Mm -hmm. So Even as we, as we mentioned, just saying Jesus in our final moments or even just believing that God exists, right? that we will be found in the book of life. And um, that's the thing, we don't, we don't have to worry about the second death, or we don't even have to worry about the first death, as we mentioned in the previous, uh, in this lesson. So, so as Christians, you, you look at death asleep, you don't have to worry about the first death because God has given us hope. Just like Isa has said, we have this hope. We grieve without hope, okay? You've accepted Jesus as your personal savior. Mm -hmm. Now, the second death we don't have to worry about because it's not for us. Yeah, the second true. death are for the wicked people, those mm -hmm. who have denied Jesus as their personal savior. People so it's who... like a, if somebody is talking about, okay, this is your sentence. This is going to be what's going to happen to you if you murder somebody. Mm -hmm. Well, Terry, have you murdered anyone? <laughs> no. No, right? So is that something you're going to be worried about? No. Okay, so that's what second death is. You don't have to worry about that. Death in itself, you don't have to worry. Mm -hmm. If you're a Christian, if, you're, if you believe in Jesus as your personal Savior. It's the people who have hardened their hearts. Correct. Right? For is the people who are going to be experiencing second death. Mm -hmm. And so, knowing all this information, right guys? Knowing all this, reading the verse, knowing the understanding of first, second death, and the book of life. Why is these following process, uh, prophecies such an encouragement for us, for our lives today, you know? Hearing death, how, how is this an encouragement, right? Or even first or second death. How are, how are these prophecies encouragement, encouraging for us? Because based on the verses we just read, death will no longer exist anymore. It will mm -hmm. be destroyed, so we wouldn't have to worry about death. And just as um, Auntie Teresa said, once we have faith in Christ, we don't, have to worry about the second death either, right? It doesn't, mm -hmm. we don't need to worry about that. It's not for us because we believe in Jesus and we have faith in Christ already. So Amen. it's not for us. It's only for the people that, you know, don't rejected want to believe Jesus. or yep. rejected. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, amen. Christ has taken the victory, right? We, not only that Christ has already won, we already see that in here. And so that just reminds me of the song, no more nights, no more mm -hmm. pain. We won't have to experience that anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, Isa, if you could read for us John 11, um, verse 11 through 14. Let's go deeper about what Jesus himself talks about in this. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Mm -hmm. So with this, what word did Jesus use to describe death? Well, it says that he's asleep. Mm -hmm. Our friend Lazarus sleeps and that he's going to go and wake him up. So it's relating that death is just sleeping. Mm -hmm. 
And so it's a re reoccurring theme that we see sleep every single time. So when we die, we sleep, and that we don't know anything, right? Um, as, you, as you could continue to read this book, Lazarus, Lazarus was what? He was, is he still, was he still dead during this time? No, he, still, he was resurrected, right? Uh, and he was raised from the dead. Uh, and if you realize, if Lazarus was resurrected today in our generation, I'm pretty sure like the press would like mm -hmm. interview, <laughs> interview him, him like crazy, yeah. right? CNN, yeah. ABC, you see like, oh, Fox how did it feel? Did you see other people? No, mm -hmm. right? That's not what happened. Was there any testimony written in the Bible? Was well, there probably any? Probably like, uh, what happened? Why am I I'm in strip cloths? What, mm -hmm. Why? Right. I must have died. Right. <laughs> he really was asleep. He really mm -hmm. did not know anything. Just the lack of any testimony in the Bible or the lack of anything written down is, uh, is a testimony. So uh, further on, let's go see a couple more verses about death and sleep. I'll read Psalms 146, verse 4. It says, His spirit departs, he returns to the earth, and that very day his plans perish. Um, we could have Isa do Psalms 115, verse 7. Verse 17? Verse 17, my bad. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down in silence. Mm. So, reading these verses, right, what, according to the scriptures, what is the human condition of sleep, of death, in these verses? That we don't know anything. Mm -hmm. We, you know, just based on what Isa just read, like, um, death doesn't praise the Lord, so once, you know, we die, we can't do anything. We can't even, you know, have final thoughts. We just know nothing. Mm -hmm. But even though we do have, even though we do know nothing, even if our family members or our loved ones know nothing when they die, Again, we like to bring back that we do have this hope, right? That, that, we have, that we are able to be resurrected in Christ to save us from death, to be with him, right? Knowing that all this information that we learn. Let's share a time when you've lost a loved one in death. What comfort did you find in knowing the truth about death from the scripture? Well, for me... A um, long time ago, back in 2012, I lost my great-grandfather. He lived up to 100 years old. Mm. And my mom, this is on my mom's side, my mom was the one who went to the funeral and we all stayed at home. And my mom would always um, say that like, oh, he's just sleeping. Because, you know, back then I didn't really understand death at a young age. My mom would always say, oh, he's sleeping, you know, like you don't need to worry about you know, about, you know, death. And then my mom would always say, that, like, we will see him again. It's not a goodbye. Like, you know, mm. we will see him again when Jesus mm. does come. Mm. It's, I like that. I like that quote right there. It's not a goodbye. It's just a see you later, you know. Um, is there any other experiences that where you have lost a loved one? I know we're pretty young, so <laughs> we might not experience, but um, this is Teresa. Um, yes, um, my, I lost my mom, your mom mama, mm -hmm. uh, 15 years ago. Mm. And uh, I hope I don't cry. I cry each time mm. because she passed away in the Philippines and I was here. And I had the opportunity to go to Philippines, but I didn't. So every time that comes up, I, it always uh, uh, brings tears to me, to my eyes. Um, they say the hardest one to lose is your mother. Mm. Because my dad passed away um, in 2017. And uh, it's not too much, you know. They say, yeah, I lost my dad, that's it. But when you ask me about my mom, <laughs> I don't want to get started. But that's what happens. Mm. We could talk on and on, but yeah. I think we need to end our yeah. discussion. It's been a wonderful yeah. one. Just. To end it off, to close everything, just make sure that uh, I know that we may be confused with our living souls, but still know that we do have this hope, that we have this hope in Christ, that he's able to resurrect us from the dead because we're not, this is not our home. Earth is not our home. And so we have this hope that burns within our hearts. You hear that song later on, 
But uh, let us close with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much with the encouragement even in this topic of death that we can know that there is hope beyond the grave through faith in Jesus. May we find that hope today and may we share that hope with others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thanks everyone for studying with us. Next week we continue our brand new lesson quarter, lesson number four, the Old Testament hope. Let's hear a young adults group two next week as they explain this hope from the Old Testament, reminding all of us of Orlando Filipino SDA's mission to know Christ and make him known. Thanks, everyone.